Thank you for joining for today's presentation, BC Energy Step Code Part 3 Energy Design Report, with a focus on report users. My name is Susan McDougall and I'm a principal with Focal Engineering. This is an online recording of a one and a half hour webinar that discusses the new report. As you can see, we've broken up the full webinar into five different recordings. So introduction and background, part three report overview, details of report sections, examples, and then process and wrap up. The full web webinar was originally provided in July, 2020. This recording is being completed in August and we'll have another live version of the same presentation for users at a date still to be determined in September 2020. A sister presentation for local governments will be delivered on August 27th. And details for all upcoming events can be found at the Energy Step Code website. We'd like to begin by acknowledging several contributors who helped make the webinar series possible. The series itself was funded through the High Performance Builder Training Fund, which is managed by Fortis BC and has the members listed on your screen. The report was developed by the Zero Emissions Building Exchange with a review by a subgroup of the Energy Step Code Part 3 and Part 9 Non-Residential Subcommittee. For the webinars themselves, we had a great advisory group and we want to thank the, uh, the uh, organizations and individuals listed on your screen who all gave us some helpful feedback as we developed these presentations. So today's agenda, as I introduced before, has an introduction and quick background on the step code, primarily as it relates to the part three design report. Then we have an overview of the design report in each section. We were asked to provide some example reports and complete them live, so we'll do that. Then we'll touch on process, the who and the when, before we wrap up. Let's start with a brief background on the step code. One thing we should know is that this presentation does assume a basic level of fluency with the step code. So we're not going to be going into a lot of detail on say the metrics and how to calculate them. But if you do need more information at any point, please feel, please uh, do visit the energy step code website. So the link is shown on your screen there. It's got lots of resources, compliance tools, design guides, and tons of other things there uh, to assist you as you're working on step code projects. So if we start with a brief history of the step code, just kind of remind ourselves the timeline that we've seen the step code develop under. It was first introduced in April, 2017, so just over three years ago, and has since had three revisions, uh, roughly a year apart in January, 2018, December, 2018, and December, 2019. So just as a reminder, the step code itself is part of the BCBC. It first came out under the BCBC 2012, and so does revision one. That was the, also uh, as part of the 2012 BCBC revisions. And then the last two step code revisions have been part of the 2018 BCBC, in this case, revisions one and two. So what's the current state of play of the step code in BC? Well, as of mid-July 2020, when we were creating this, this content, um, there were 66 jurisdictions consulting on the BC Energy Step Code and 38 jurisdictions already referencing it. So we should remind ourselves that the step code itself was designed as a consistent way for jurisdictions to require part three projects to exceed base BC building code or BCBC energy requirements. So if we follow that top line first, complying with BCBC, just remember that there are currently a couple of ways we can do that. So the first is using ASHRAE standard 90.1-2016, and the second is using the National Energy Code for Buildings, NECB 2015. Now, both of those paths, ASHRAE and NECB, actually have three subpaths, and you can comply with either standard using prescriptive, trade-off, or performance methodology, the performance being similar to an, or being using an energy model. So that's complying with BCBC. 
And then on the bottom path, that's where we see how we now can exceed the BCBC. And this is where the step code comes into play, which is part 10.2.3 of the code. So we've broken out step one and kind of compared it similar to the ASHRAE and NECB paths. Now, we just put a little asterisk there because we, we need to note that step one energy performance may not exceed BCBC. Both use NECB 2015, which is very similar to what we're looking at right above the NECB 2015 compliance route. However, step one does add the Vancouver Energy Modeling Guidelines. We'll be talking about that more in a slide or two. But it's just worth noting that they're actually very similar. NECB compliance uh, with an energy model and step one are, are quite similar. Steps two plus, however, introduce new energy requirements, which we'll talk about on this slide. So just revisiting step one again for a second, as I mentioned, it requires an energy model that conforms to NECB 2015 part eight as well as the City of Vancouver Energy Modeling Guidelines. Step one also requires whole building air tightness testing. However, it's worth noting that the results from the air tightness test do not need to be put back into the final model. Just the testing has to be done and reported. Now for steps two plus, this is where we see these new metrics come into play. So the first one is the total energy use intensity or TUI. Then there's the thermal energy demand intensity, known as TEDI. There's an overheating hours limit for any passively cooled spaces. And there's also whole building air tightness testing for steps two plus building. However, these results do need to be put back into the final model and the project still needs to comply with all the previous requirements, the TUI and the TEDI, et cetera, with the actual air tightness testing requirements. So all of these requirements that we've talked about from step one to two plus, these are basically determined through an energy model with the exception of air tightness. That's of course something that you're gonna be measuring on site for your actual building. And we just wanted to note that the number that is required, the value that you're looking for for your particular project actually can vary now based on heating degree days. So this is something that came out in the most recent revision of the step code. So we're just kind of flagging it because it's still a little bit new. So just making sure that it's on everybody's radar, basically. So we've been talking about the step code requirements. We just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page with the building types that they apply to. So first of all, it's important to recognize that they're based on major occupancy of the building. So group C residential occupancies. These are part of the step code. There are four possible steps. So step one, two, three, four. And there are values that are required for either hotels and motels or for other residential projects. Group D, so business and personal service occupancies. These have three steps and there are targets for office projects and there are values for other business and personal service occupancies. Then we have Group E mercantile occupancies. These have three steps for retail projects. And finally, uh, Group AB assembly, treatment, and care occupancies. These were also just introduced in the most recent revision to the step code. So this includes schools, libraries, colleges, rec centers, hospitals, and care centers. And at the moment, there's only one step required. So they, they only need to do the NECB 2015 plus Vancouver modeling guidelines, energy model, and air tightness testing. That's the only step code requirement at the moment for these building types. However, it's probably not a stretch to anticipate that there will likely be some step two plus requirements coming in future revisions of the step code. Now we've alluded to the City of Vancouver Energy Modeling Guidelines already in the presentation a few times, so we want to highlight a couple, a couple of aspects of them. First of all, as the name would suggest, they are issued and uh, revised by the City of Vancouver. However, they do apply to any step code energy modeling projects. They are currently at version 2.0. 
and the guidelines mandate some energy modeling inputs, and they also provide some guidance around uh, different types of results and different building typologies. And this is in section five, and we want to touch on that because that is going to come up in the part three energy design report. So if you need a copy of these guidelines, they are available at the link shown on your screen. Okay, so looking at section five of the report, it actually has two subsections. So the first one, 5.1, is for mixed use buildings. So this is when you have multiple occupancies with at least one step code occupancy. And it tells us that the project has to meet the blended requirements between the different occupancies. And that's blended based on weighted, uh, weighted by floor area. It also tells us that the step code occupancies have to meet the blended Teddy target between all of those step code occupancies. Now section 5.2 gets into what we have to do if there are other building types that do not have step code requirements. So they didn't appear in that list a few slides ago of the, the group C, D, et cetera, occupancies that have step code requirements. So if you have a building with a partial occupancy without step code requirements, you need to use the reference building approach for those portions of the building. Now the reference building can be per ASHRAE 90.1 2016 or NECB 2015. So that's basically just borrowing from other pieces of the BCBC. And then section 5.2 also includes some other requirements to be aware of such as derating our values for the reference building the same way you would do it in the propose. So basically the, the kind of key point here is energy modeling guidelines, section five, really important read if you're working on a mixed use building. So before we dive into the report itself, let's get an understanding of what's required to be reported for a step code project. So this is described in Division C, Section 2.2.9.2. And I've actually got a screenshot of that whole section on the screen here. I, can, I apologize, I know the text is a little bit small, but it's just to show you it's um, not a very big section of the code. Again, it's really well worth a read just to make sure that you're familiar with what needs to be reported. Um, so yeah, this section actually describes the energy design report requirements, and so that was used as a basis when the part three design report was first uh, prepared. And it also describes requirements for reporting prior to occupancy. So what's happened before we had this part three report? Well, up to now for part three buildings, generally an energy modeling report is issued by whoever did the modeling. And if that individual is an engineer or an architect, then it would be sealed and according to the professional practice guidelines on whole building energy modeling services. In the part nine world, and this is the one a time that we kind of dive into that briefly in this presentation, they've been using a standardized report in Excel format for quite a while. And it's been really well used in industry and it's been developed and further iterated with, uh, with different learnings. And so this part three report builds on the success of the part nine report. And that's what we're gonna be talking about next. 